Okay, hi Dan, out the other side of the timer. Um, so first and foremost, um, thank you very much for for lending your time and, and expertise on all of this. I, I really appreciate you um, just coming on, even if you're not feeling brilliant. So I'm sorry for dragging you out. No problem at all, always a pleasure. So the, the scope of this really for me is I, uh, as part of the book that, that Amy and I are putting together, we, we've done a, a, a sort of a large analysis of the digital transformation, um, uh, I, I suppose frameworks is probably the best way of putting it, of which there's been, you know, academically speaking, there's probably uh, 18 or so different frameworks and uh, it's quite complex and, and, and difficult to interpret. Um, within those frameworks, there are sort of 60 different aspects that are um, collective collectively discussed within those frameworks you know ranging from your culture to your leadership to your technologies um, and they get very nuanced uh, in some of the more sort of disparate uh, and early frameworks in particular but we, we sort of picked up on five or six which are consistent throughout every single one of them and they exist in all of them and one of them is is data um, so data as a as a concept is a is a digital transformation stalwart it's in everything um, and, and I'm just starting to build up uh, a sort of a picture and an idea about how we're going to cover sort of a chapter around around data that that's that's the concept um, and, and if I'm honest Dan I don't I don't really know where I, I want to start it I don't know where to go with it um, and I just really I wanted to use this time to um, to try and, and sort of, you know, get your thoughts on, on where we go with it. But that's probably, I suppose, in a way, framing the, the conversation I want to have. But before perhaps you answer that element and, and what your, your thoughts are on, on data within real estate, could just for the, you know, the basis of anybody that is watching this in the future, or whenever it is, just give people a bit of a pricey um, as to your background within this field, because I think it's particularly interesting and, and some may not know. Yeah, sure. So, so I've worked in real estate all my career, not necessarily in data technology. I started off not in that, um, yeah. in more sort of business development, market strategy type approach. And more and more, everything became data driven or needed to be become data driven is probably more accurate. And then after a few years working in a couple of companies, I took a role at Ordnance Survey, leaving, leading their, their approach to the land and property sector. So Ordnance Survey is well known for its hiking maps. That's about 5% of what they do. 95% is around geospatial data, data analysis, and underpinning an awful lot of what we do in the property sector, whether that's conveyancing, through to planning, through to development, and so on. Um, I was there for a few years. I led a, a government project, so a, a cross-government project, looking at public sector asset management, um, which was certainly a steep learning curve, and, and happy to go into a bit more about that if, if useful. I then moved from Ordnance Survey and joined a company that was known at the time as IPD, now MSCI, which is a large American company. And they specialize in uh, valuation data for uh, investment portfolios, so um, fund management, uh, investment property. Uh, and they do valuation data and they provide, in particular, indices and benchmarking. And then they go into some other areas as well, particularly in of interest for investors, so sustainability data, occupier data, and so on. And then I left there and moved to RICS, and my role at RICS was looking after the uh, data and information products that they do. So they have a number of different online platforms and services. Uh, one of the large things I looked after was BCIS, which is an industry solution for, uh, it started off being cost information and then moved onwards again. So indices, indexes, sustainability data, carbon data, and so on. So I've been really fortunate to look at it for from a number of different angles. Uh, and then whilst I was at RSCS, I picked up the, the, the job title of, or the challenge of how is technology going to change the sector and what to RICS about it, do about it. Mm. I think James, that's, that's where we started first talking because we were some of the people talking about this a long, long time ago. Yeah, um, yeah. So that's where I went. And then uh, about five years ago, I started my own consultancy, helping people with... Jeez, it's five years. I know, it's frightening. Um, <laughs> transformation and, and data strategies. Um, I work with a mixture of government, industry bodies, property companies, and tech companies. 
and also at the time um, was founder or am the founder of the Real Estate Data Foundation, which is a not-for-profit initiative bringing together industry bodies around the topic of data. Um, our ambitions are incredibly modest, I think, although it's a big topic, so it's quite hard to achieve. Um, and there are two objectives. The first one is connecting conversations, initiatives, people around the topic of data in the sector. Um, we are incredibly siloed as a sector. It's a well-trodden cliche. And we collect data in the, those silos and we use data in those silos. Now, actually being siloed works okay for us as a sector, if we're honest, but from a data point of view, it works terribly. So if you want to, for example, understand the sustainability impact of a building, it's impossible to do that without looking at lots of different time frames, time slices, different bits of data from different places to, to get a, a full picture. So that's the first one. And then the second one is data ethics. Um, and I think there are two reasons behind data ethics. Um, ethics is just the should we question. So everyone thinks about, are you able to get the data? There's plenty of people talking about the sensors, the, what you can collect, where you can get it from. The second one is the legalities. We're pretty good at that. So GDPR or, or many others. The should we question is something that we don't ask very often. We assume that if we've got the data and we're legally covered, that's fine. And I'm not sure that's the case. And I think there are two elements there. I think thinking about the ethical use of data is the right thing to do. It's important. We don't have a greatest reputation as a sector. And secondly, I think that uh, all of the noise around AI technology automation, which is which isn't going to have a massive impact over the coming months, years, and decades, I'm I'm really optimistic about the role of people as long as they evolve. And I think the bit that people are going to do are the human bits that technology can't do so well. And I think ethical judgment is going to be a key part of that. So, for example, if you're a property manager, what sort of data should you collect and what different purposes? And again, happy to go into a couple of examples about that. Jeez. I mean, the, the, the challenge I always have when preparing for all of the interviews that either I've done or, or Amy's done is you, you always start with a, an, an element of questioning that you want to go down because you're sort of testing your assumptions and you're always analyzing and overanalyzing sort of, you know, the assumptions that you're making in, in all of the reading that you've got and everything like that. And then you always find when you start an interview that actually you throw all the questions out really, and then they just sort of pull you back as, as a benchmarking point. So I, I just want to explore some of that. Um, going back to your ordnance survey time, um, and I, Christ, I'd forgotten that you were in that. I, I really had, and it's sad, isn't it? Um, but you talked about the public sector asset management um, project. Just just because the public and private thing is something I'm really quite interested in. Uh, and I know you're very UK centric, but there, there's real um, differences in public and, and private uh, globally. It's a trend I've seen all over. But talk to me about the public sector asset management project you did. And then I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit later on, I think about the government digital transformation stuff that you're involved with. So yeah, start with that ordnance survey project. What, what, what did it entail? What, what did you learn? So, so, so yeah, you're right. And actually a, a, probably about half my work is UK and about half is, is non UK. So. Oh, okay, as um, much as that. Okay, cool. So I, I probably know more about the UK data, especially from the government point of view, but I've done quite a bit of work for international governments, which is always interesting to see the strengths and weaknesses. Um, yeah. So so, so government over a long time has had a lot of, so, so government has two different roles uh, in this, or, or arguably three roles. One is it owns a lot of property. Um, the second one is it's in charge of policy that influences the property sector. And then either part of that or, or separately is it has a huge amount of data. And over many, many years, it's realized that there's a lot of synergy between all those data organizations. You can argue about which ones they are, but they try and bring them together and look for opportunities. When you um, say there's a lot of synergy, as in the, the, the data crosses over quite a lot, or what, what, what did you mean by that? Just to be so, so pretty much every term. So, so the data crosses over a lot. If you look at the crossover between land registry and ordnance survey, for example, 
there's yeah. a massive crossover in terms of the data. They rely on each other's information. Um, something like the VOA or some of the uh, data that's used for planning or CON29 searches or local land charges searches is based on Ordnance okay. Survey, which ties in. But also, there is a joint um, aspiration, which is to use the data better and make it more accessible and help people. So um, the data is originally collected for one purpose. How do you get that out? And, and being used somewhere else. So there's a lot of synergy between those organizations and, and that that can, can be in many different ways. And the public data group is um, one of the, the second or third in, initiative that government has run over the last 20 years to try and bring those organizations together. The latest one, which I think is, um, which is the most successful, I think, and I, I, I'm involved with is the Geospatial Commission, which looks after the six organizations. They were slightly different ones in the past. Um, so the aim was how can the project was how can we use all of that data to help the public sector to manage their assets better so how do we use the public sector data to manage public sector assets better now from an asset management point of view there were some really good examples so there was a case in Hampshire but there were loads of them where you could take two not very great buildings which were half empty exit those go into another building and you end up having a huge cost saving and a much better building the theory behind that is quite straightforward the practicality is how do you identify those buildings what do you mean by a public sector building what do you how do you get out of a lease if they're ending at different times and all of those different practicalities and so that project was about how do you bring together public sector data to understand that and if you look at sorry um, just to, but just to go into that is, is that because it lacked any form of transparency beforehand as to why it was so hard to uncover that so i think it was probably a few different reasons so so the first one is the data is 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 not easy to get hold of at mass level data sets so if you want to get hold of right. a piece of ordnance survey data or land registry data or something else for a planning application it's really straightforward if you're doing a if you're buying a property and you want to check on who's registered owner really straightforward if you want to get the entire national data set and start analyzing it backwards that gets really difficult or costly or it's just impossible right so that's the first thing is is the data itself is relatively easy to get but at a national scale so you go down is quite difficult the second thing is the interoperability between different data sets is never is never as easy as it seems so putting two appear, apparently good things together gets very very difficult um so i've been talking a lot about the the uprn the unique property reference number uh, uh, which is perhaps again another separate topic but one of the things that we're very very bad at across the entire property sector is is address data so if we are talking about different buildings then we're never going to be able to do some very powerful analysis. Um, so that's the second part. The other thing is that everyone has a different uh, vested interest in protecting their IP. And it's not through necessarily will of not wanting to share. It's about data that is not managed is rubbish. It needs to be managed and kept up to date. Now, there are lots of different funding models, and there are lots of different people who have different views on the funding models. Yeah, I, have, I think, I mean, I've got my views about when and where, but if you want all data to be given away free, that's fine, but it needs to be funded and managed somewhere else. And there's the, then the debate about how do you protect that and fund it going forward? What often happens with organizations is people think it should be given away free and it will magically just keep itself um, up to date. So there are lots of different interests in that. The final point, which is difficult, is how do you actually define a public sector building? And when you're talking about data analysis, then you and I talking about what a public sector data building is, is we'll, we'll throughout the conversation slightly change our interpretation and come to a common ground because it's, it's pretty sensible. From a data point of view, it's not very good at that. It needs a black and white, this is definitely public sector and this is definitely not. And it's a very nuanced area. So to give you an example, if a local authority owns a building, they use the building and it's theirs, it is clearly a public sector building. What happens if they own the building and they rent it out to a private sector? I think most people would say it's probably public sector, but discuss. And then you get into what if it's a private sector building that the public sector are renting? And that's probably public sector as well, but in a different use case. And what about schools where they're then academies or public schools or private schools or whatever it might be, what, what counts as a public and private? And so actually having clear definitions about some of these things are really, really important. 
having those definitions from a data point of view, in my view, is more important than what the definitions actually are. Because as long as you're all talking the same language, it doesn't matter so much. Okay, so just take me back in terms of, from a public data perspective, why is the clarity on all of what you've just said in that last two minute monologue, why is that important from a data perspective? Just so I'm clear on what you're trying to get across. So um, I don't think it's clear from, it's important or clear from a, needs to be clear from a, data point of view, it needs to be clear from an asset management point of view. So if you're a local oh, authority okay. and I'm central government, it needs to be clear what we're talking about and what we're trying to achieve. Now, the next point, which I'm going to contradict myself on is then you need to go and find the data to give you that answer. But you can't have the data unless it's clear what you're talking about. So if, if a central government department, local authority says, I'd like to go and find all of the public sector assets in this area, you need to have a definition of what the public sector assets are before you can search for it. I think you might be on mute. Are you on mute? Sorry, I thought I'd unmuted myself. I was coughing, so I didn't want to um, splutter. Like that that it's one of the two. <laughs> I know, it's bad, isn't it? Um, <laughs> So uh, it's getting, uh, yeah, it, it's very, the, the clarity and the importance of being accurate is, is so clear because if you're not right at the start, everything you then build off of that is rubbish, right? That's the whole point and the whole principle. So I think, I think it just, just as a sort of context of, of my view of data in the property sector as a whole, before we get into some of the more specifics is, I, I think there's a real misunderstanding of what data is. And I think there are lots of cliches around data. So for example, it's the new oil. I don't think that's very helpful. Um, data is purely a record of something that someone has captured somewhere about something. Now we can argue about where, what's information, what's data, what's digital, what's not. But broadly speaking, yeah. it's just a thing that is captured. The first thing is there's, there's no reason to say that that's correct. Um, and so, so if you look at so just it, because you captured it doesn't mean it's right. Okay. Right. Yeah. And I think there's often an assumption that if I've got the data on something, that data is correct. And that is a, a real problem. Um, the second thing is culturally from a real estate point of view, we treat data in the same way as we treat buildings. And this really isn't a, a, a criticism in, in many ways. And, and all the digital transformation stuff that you've done, you've spoken about, and you've worked with clients, I am positive this will be one of the main things that's come up is it's about culture rather than anything else. And if you yeah. look at the property sector, we are designed to be low risk, evidence, backward looking, evidence based. We cannot fail because you don't want a building falling down. We're really long term and slow. So if those are our characteristics from a data point of view or, or from a digital transformation point of view, you want the exact opposite. Fail fast, forward looking, move quickly, and so what we tend to do is treat data as a slow moving physical asset when it is a quick moving intangible asset. So just from a cultural point of view, we don't fully understand or use data in the right way. We assume that it is, it is a factual thing that can't be replicated. I'm making generalizations here, but I think as, a, as an overall cultural point, I think that's a, a real challenge. So data for me underpins everything that we do in the sector going forward. And we need to make sure we've got those foundations in place up front. The one thing that I'll jump on is, is your point before, is, is it is black and white. It is by definition ones and zeros. Therefore, you have to be very, very clear to have that quality up front. So when you say it's not clear what data is, or you don't think the industry thinks, you know, understands what data is, what do you think they think it is? And why, and why is that? Because I, I've not ever, if I'm honest, Dan, I've not ever heard anyone say that before. So I'm quite interested in your sort of reasoning on that. Mm. Well, I think, I think, um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm making some big generalizations here, but I, I certainly stand by them. But I, I think if you look at, um, let me think of a good example. So if you talk about building height, it's a hot topic at the moment from a building safety point of view, we can discuss how it's measured and what you do. Building height, if I give you a, the height of a building, it doesn't necessarily mean it's correct. And more, more so, 
it could be correct and different from another data set, which is also correct. So for example, the architect's plans will say a building is 17 meters tall. And someone who um, checked the building this morning says it's three falls tall. And someone who goes out with a laser survey says it's 18.32 meters tall. They're all slightly different data sets and yeah. they've got different attributes. So the time that it was done, the accuracy, how it was measured, mean that all three of those data sets are slightly different. They're all about the same thing. Um, and we don't consider that you can get data. Uh, typically in the property sector, we assume that the height is the height. So if I tell you the height is 18 meters, that's a fact. Uh, it, it's not. It depends on how you've measured it. It depends on when you measured it. It depends on all sorts of different things. So, so it's a fact of how it was captured with that metadata. And just so I'm clear again, it, it, it sort of dragging that out, and this is going to sound a very, I suppose, a, a flippant question, but probably one that some who are not understanding of the importance of it would ask, which is why is that important? No, it's a fair point. I, I think the answer is it depends what you want to do with it. So, so again, sticking with the building height, I'll give you a couple of examples. If you are going to construct a building, knowing that it's two floors high is not really a great indicative you know, number of floors. If you are going to do a delivery as an online delivery system, then knowing it's two or three floors high is fine. And so what you need to do is you need to know the answer for what you're achieving it with. So the, the discussion about quality of data, I've not articulated that very well. The discussion about quality of data is something that people often talk about. The data is really good, it's really bad. If you don't know what you want to use it for, it's impossible, I would argue, to judge whether it's good or bad. And so the data has to serve a purpose. It's something that you and I have spoken about a lot. Data, technology, for the sake of data and technology, is pretty pointless. It has to serve a purpose. And as an industry, we're about buying, building, selling, managing properties. So that data needs to be of quality to answer a particular question or task that you're trying to do. If that data is wrong, then you're going to base your assumptions on incorrect data. Yeah, okay, that, that makes more sense. And taking that aspect then to, to an earlier point you made about us working in silos, is that part of the challenge of, of that? Because if we're working in silos, we haven't got the transparency of the data, which then undermines the quality of the data because we can't ask the appropriate questions if we haven't got access to it. Is that is that a fair review of, or overview of why that's a problem yeah. for the data silos that we've got? Is there yeah. anything else to add on really, that? There are, so I would agree with that. I'd, I'd go further. There are a couple of different things. So the first thing is um, every silo is an interface which stops data transferring easily across it. So, um, so that's the first thing, which is a real problem. But there's also another problem, which is we're trying to solve data problems in those silos, and we're coming to different answers. So again, if we use the building height perspective, if one silo at construction stage decides that we're going to measure it in this particular way, and then in operational sides, you measure it in a different way, even if you can get the data to flow across, it's very difficult to get it to, uh, to, to, to line up. And so even if you theoretically have the data from both stages or both silos, then it's still very difficult to, to keep it going across. Now, building height isn't the best example there because it doesn't tend to change a huge amount. It's pretty straightforward. Yeah. But where it is a good example is things like sustainability. So that's gone up the agenda quite, quite correctly. If you ask everyone about sustainability, almost every report that's coming out is saying the biggest barrier to um, us achieving our sustainability is data or lack of data. It's the challenge that we've got. But everyone means different things by it. There are hundreds of different certifications. There are different measurements. So we talk about operational carbon or embodied carbon or energy use. What about the energy use that we create ourselves? Everyone has a different way of measuring and capturing, in inverted commas, sustainability data. So we've got this position where most of the market is now, which is a great step forwards, clear that sustainability is important. We all want to get data on what that means. And we all can't access any data. And when we can access data, it's in lots of different formats talking about different things. So we're now in the situation where a building that you and I could talk about, you will say it's one of the best performing sustainable buildings in the world. I'll tell you what's one of the worst, 
and we're both right. And that doesn't help very much. So I'm, for example, I'm looking at energy use, you're looking at uh, embodied carbon. Got you. Because it's the appropriate question that you're answer, you're asking based yeah. on a different data set entirely. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So in terms of that data quality, data standardization, removing data silos, what, what, what does the industry need to, to improve all of, of that side? And is it a UK issue or is, are you seeing that in all of the global stuff that you're doing as well? Uh, so I'm going to answer that in two ways about the UK global bit. So if I just answer on the general sector bit, which is absolutely global, um, we probably need to change a few things. Firstly, we need to understand the value of data. I think we've been on a journey over the last five or 10 years, which is a really positive journey, um, just not going as fast as I think it, it could or, or should. So we went through a period of talking about data. Uh, and everyone thought it was really important, very much coincided with data as the new oil type buzzword. Yeah. Um, and we worked out that it's really important, but we couldn't really work out why or what we were trying to achieve it. And so we moved on from talking about data. We then started talking about the things that we absolutely should be talking about, which is um, the home buying and selling process, the building safety side of things, improving the planning process, understanding the valuation of buildings better, uh, improving the performance on, on people or on the planet. And in each of those situations, we were focused on how do we make better buildings, which is a sector generalization is, is what we should be focusing on. Yeah. The problem we then found is we can't actually do that and measure it because we don't have good enough data. So whilst we haven't necessarily moved as far from a data point of view, I think there's been a real shift that we now have clear use cases about why we want data. So, um, and, those, and those being back to your sustainability point or, or others? Almost everything. If you look at if you look at building safety, one of the main parts that's coming out of that is the is to have a golden thread of data. If you look at the public sector asset report, the all party parliamentary group wrote a report saying the biggest problem they've got is the lack of data. If you look at the renters reform bill, the centre of that is the landlord um, database to have data on on the private sector renter. If you look at the planning process, one of the main things they're looking to do is digitize it and have better data. If you look at sustainability, all the reports are saying that we need to have better data. If you put on your land aid hat and look at homelessness, if I can extreme, I know that's sort of on the edges of the property sector, but the, the groups come out, the all party parliamentary group came out and said the biggest problem is data. All of these different use cases and almost every single one that's property related is saying we've got a problem with data. So just to be a little bit contentious with that, is that is it not just that people realize, you know, that they just haven't got the data, therefore the easy thing to say is, oh, we can't do that because we haven't got the data. Is it not an easy way out for them? I mean, yes, yes. I mean, there are some caveats to that, but yes, broadly speaking, if if we want to... I mean, one of the problems with, with any type of data is it brings transparency. Now, yeah. everyone will tell you that that's a great thing. But, but what they actually mean is the people who want transparency think it's a great thing. And the people who don't want transparency don't think it's a great thing, but they can't admit it. And often, if you look at sustainability, then by definition, 50% of buildings are going to be above average in performance and 50% below. It's very easy to not want to be risking being in the 50% if you don't need to be. Yeah, but, but so let's use a more applied example. You, you mentioned safety. You mentioned um, uh, things around lettings as well and, and homelessness as well. Isn't it pushing the can down the road in the sense of the easy thing to say is we haven't got the data to make the decision? And therefore, we go through a big exercise of, of finding data, which we, I mean, I, I can't believe we haven't got the data. Well, I think there are two angles on that. So the first one is is or maybe we don't know where the data is. Is that is that or how it's stored or where it's stored or? Well, I think there are two two angles. So the first thing is, if you look at something like homelessness or sustainability or whatever it is, there is no question that there are things that we ought to be doing as a sector that we're not. And sometimes right. not having the data is an excuse, because we should just be doing stuff that we know is in our heart right. Where I would come at it from it differently um, is. If you've got good data and if you can measure performance and you can identify what you should be doing, which actions are the best? So there's some statistics about things like HVAC systems are worth 
huge amounts of the energy use at the buildings. You're much better off focusing on just solving that than you are changing another 23 things somewhere else. But we need the data to be able to point in that direction. You also need the data to be able to identify and report on how you're doing. So uh, I was in uh, Paris for COP21 years ago. Mm. We're talking about all these ambitions and it's well known that 37 to 40% of carbon and energy comes from the property sector. How can we possibly prove that we're improving things if we don't have the data to demonstrate it? So but we must have had the data in the first place in order to come up with those statistics. No, they're all academic um, based things. I mean, we don't have the data on every single building that's out there. And we could do the same again, an academic study to understand it. But if we want it to be truly data driven, then uh, very often that data doesn't exist or it isn't accessible or it's not usable. And does it come back also to the, the point you made earlier on about protecting IP and the fact that we're very protective of, of any data that has been collected? Yeah, I think I mean, I think there's a real cultural pro problem that um, we. Most people fit into the share all data or don't share any data categories. And the right. answer is, is normally to be a sort of Goldilocks cliche somewhere in between. There are some data sets which is going to be beneficial to, to share. And there are some data sets which are a competitive edge. Therefore, you may as well keep hold of them because they're a competitive edge. So let's just go back onto that protecting of the IP bit. Some data is good to share, some not. What, why, why is, and, and you also said, we don't have a good background about data ethics. You, you, you said that before. We, we don't, historically, we've not had a good record when it comes to that. What, why is all of that? A, you know, what, why does the industry have an issue with sharing of data? We're too busy concerned about what we've got. Is it because the industry doesn't know the value of the data? Is it because the industry doesn't have the data? Is it because the industry yeah, just help me understand that bit. I think, I think probably to answer that, so yes, all of the above. <laughs> I, I think to help is probably worth looking at something like pharmaceuticals. So if you look at data science courses that you go on, the, the, the sort of leading edge that you will often find about is in pharmaceuticals. And they have some really big advantages over the property sector about why they're good at data. So the first thing is they're big companies. And they're big companies, which means they have a lot of money and they have huge amounts of data. If you take yeah. the top, I mean, I don't know what the actual numbers here are, but if you take the top 10 global pharmaceutical companies, they will have a massive market share. If you take the top 10 property owners, we haven't even scratched the surface. Even if they've got several thousand buildings, it's it's negligible in the big scheme of things. So, so these companies have got huge amounts of resources and huge amounts of data. And if they get together with just a small number of other companies, they can take a really fair shot of the market. Property doesn't have any of those. The second thing is introducing uh, pharmaceutical products is extraordinarily expensive. Yeah. Therefore, if you can speed it up a little bit, if you can make it a little bit more likely to succeed and you can stop a little bit earlier, having good data will inform all of those. And the 0.1% the, the increment is massive. From a property point of view, then, of course, the assets that we've got are, are big and chunky and, and expensive. But still, shifting the price or the value by 0.01% isn't a massive number in the same way. Because of all of that, and because of our culture of dealing with physical assets, we have not historically been very good at dealing with data. That isn't really a criticism. We've just not needed to. So if you go into most property companies, if you go into, let's pick on a valuation firm, the amount of data that's used is very often spreadsheet based. It's in a system and we don't use not lots and lots of data points. So we use a number of comparable rents or capital values. We scale it up or down depending on the region that you're in because we've got an index for that. We'll look at the size of the building and scale it up. Pharmaceuticals will be looking at billions of data points. Property will eventually be looking at billions of data points. And so we've got that, that sort of market structure of we're incredibly fragmented and we have companies who don't have huge amounts of resources. Uh, we're all, you know, property owners are very wealthy, but they're still teams very often of the biggest companies of 100, 200 people with 
not huge amounts of cash to invest in R&D or an analysis. If you get 10 companies together, we're still not scratching the market. And that's where things like IPD or BCIS come along because they can bring together people at that sort of scale. But that's a lot of work to get people to agree to, to do it and move on. Yeah, and, and I have to say that the, the fragmented sector aspect, I hadn't considered that before. I think that's a really interesting perspective. Um, and, and I was... It, <laughs> I was reminded the other day that something that something that I've said a lot is that we we exist within a very homogenous asset class. And someone actually said, well, actually, no, we don't really. We it, it appears to be homogenous, but actually it's not because you, you strip away the windows and the concrete and actually every building is completely and utterly different from the systems it's got to the technologies it's got to the, you know, the build and, and all this sort of stuff. And as a consequence, I'm, I'm assuming really that that capacity for data collection uh, within buildings is also very different, whether we residential, retail, industrial, commercial, so on and so forth. Um, so there's fragmentation, not just in terms of ownership, but also in terms of asset type. And then even within the asset types, there are massive difference between, you know, a shop to another shop and whether it's a German shop or a US shop. Um, so yeah, I, the fragmentation bit is really quite. Um... And you can you can go into much more detail than that. I mean, that's a really good point. But if you look at offices, a single let office with a big occupier or a single let office with a small <laughs> occupier, small as in company size, will treat it differently. A multi let building will treat it differently from a building which is part multi let and part um, space as a service. They all have different operating models and different data models and different systems. And it is building specific. And there are plenty of people trying to standardize it, but we're a long way from doing that at the moment. And even worse than that, we're going to have an absolute, we're going to have quite a big problem with offices not, ha not being needed in time. And we don't have enough residential space. So we're going to see offices all of a sudden talking, talking to residential. Yeah. So we've got all those problems in, re in, in offices. Residential is falling over itself with problems around data. And then we're going to throw into the mix and an office building has become a residential building, which is going to make it another quantum of difficulty. Because of why? Because, because at the moment, the way we're trying to work out how to manage, measure and manage and store data in offices is different from the people who are trying to manage store and, and create data in the residential sector. Right. Okay. So the, the, the flexibility of asset classes in the future and the interchangeability of them is going to cause further problems because of the yeah the, it's really the, interesting if you look at the the building safety bill so 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 crudely the golden thread of data is mandated i don't think it's as clear as it could be about what that exactly is but whatever that is it applies to residential buildings over 18 meters i would argue that that's just what the legislation says i think from a sector point of view how are you going to not how are you not going to do the same thing from a data point of view if the building's 17.99 meters? Do you want to be the one who goes out and says, well, you're a centimeter short, so we didn't manage the data, which is considered critical for the safety, safety of this building because it's not mentioned in legislation. And that's a facetious example about the 17.99, but where do you draw the line? 17, 16, 15? And so for me, that 18 meter, that high rise building is about prioritizing the bigger risk buildings, not we shouldn't be doing the other buildings. And if we're doing it on residential buildings, how can we then in the office sector say, well, because it doesn't get covered in the legislation, we don't think it's as important to have a safe building in the office side of things. So I think that these things that are very clearly high rise residential actually apply to all residential and actually apply to all assets. Yeah, I get it. It's very complex and it, it's binary, that, but that's the, that's the problem, right? I mean, data is always going to be binary, but drawing the line. Um, going, going back a step to the interoperability challenge that you've mentioned, um, it, it's always talked about within data. Just, just share with me your thoughts around the challenge of interoperability of data. So uh, there, are, there are a couple of different perspectives. So, so the first one is if you and I collect the same data about the same thing, but we're using different standards, those standards will mean that we capture it in a slightly different way, we measure it in a slightly different way, and so on. A really good example for that is IPMS. So the International Property Management Standards, 
uh, I'll, I'll get this slightly wrong, but I think that it was JLL who said that the same office building in different markets could be up to 25% different floor area, correctly measured. And we're talking about just measuring the floor area of an office. And that feels as though that should be pretty straightforward and self-explanatory. And that's because some places include the car park, some places don't. Some places measure to the outside of a gargoyle, some to the outside of all, some to the inside of a window, sometimes to the interval. All of these different things are really small, nuanced things, but they add up to being a real problem. So if you look internationally, our entire market is based on things per square foot or per square meter. And we think about the exchange rate because that's pretty easy to, to, to work out. And we'll then benchmark and compare it. The problem is that per square foot or square meter is, is not consistent. And it's not because the unit itself is, it's because the way that we measure. So forgive me. <laughs> you and I tell you, you and I are a right old pair today. This is not a good thing. Between the two of us, it's gonna, yeah, it's going. Oh, well. it's wonderful. So, so, um, so we have a load of data sets that appear to be in the same language, in the same units about the same thing, and they aren't. Because and, the measurement in the first instance in that example is totally different. Yes. So it all comes back down to, I mean, everything that we're talking about, interoperability, um, storage standards and everything, it comes back to put shit in, get shit out, is, is ultimately what we're talking about. And yeah. my, my last bit before I go on to the sort of the more um, broader global discussion and government discussion is... I'm assuming this is what we're trying to do and achieve with trying to create some form of data standards and data quality benchmarking. Is that is that right? And if that is right, it, how, how could it possibly be successful mm. given the broadness of the sector? So, so there are a few things to say on that. So I wrote a report uh, about four years ago on all the standards, the data standards, by which I don't mean data standards just uh, on their own. I mean standards influence data. So IPMS, for example, is about how you measure. And it came up with, I think, 350 different standards in the UK that affected the real estate industry. And, and that was not... Give, give me some examples of what that would be, just I, so I understand. Uh, IPMS, Oscar Do standards, um, the Red Book creates valuation data that comes out. Um, there, there are a load of different standards on sustainability, energy performance, the BRIAM, the you know, wide score. You can apply all of these as standards to some degree or or, or, or other. Right. And so um, the answer is not let's create one single standard. It's just not practical. And that would be lovely. But there is an old, an old adage in standing, standard setting, which is you have 10 different standards. Everyone agrees we need to have one standards we all get together and create it and then six months later we've got 11 standards and so right. it's just it's just not gonna not gonna work the two things that we need to do uh, at a practical level is agree what we're talking about and build that language and that definition into all of the different types of standards that are out there now within the real estate sector i think there's actually a lot of consolidation that could be done there's a lot of duplication even if we ignore that, if you come up with your own standard and I come up with my own standards, we can argue about which one's best and we can get other people to use it or not. But if we're agreed that we're talking about an apple being an apple and an orange being an orange, and we articulate that, then actually someone using my standards can start comparing it to the, someone using your standard because we're talking about the same thing. So that's yeah. the first thing is, is just those definitions and having it. The Real Estate Data Foundation has got a, a st standards expert group, which is which is doing some great stuff, and it's making some really good strides around those definitions that people can then use in their standards. So we're not trying to suggest there should be one standard for everything because that's just not practical. But just a transparency and understanding of what yeah. that standard stands for. Exactly. Yeah, get it. The second thing is, yeah. uh, and this is the most basic level from a property point of view, and it's almost disappointing that this is a big step forward, but but nevertheless, I think it is. If you talk about a building and I talk about a building, we are very rarely talking about the same thing. Now, from a human to human point of view, we, we often are. From a data point of view, we're often not. So I'll give you some examples. An office block, you will say, is the big red building on the high street in Bognor Regis. And I'll say it's number 32 on the high street. 
a computer finds that difficult to tie together because you know it and I know it. And so from a human to human point of view, we know that we're talking about it. But from a technology point of view, it says, well, that's two different addresses. You then get to the stage of um, uh, an office building with four different companies in. So you put the company name. I'll put the same address, but with a different company name. Is that the same building or is it not? And so that's why I think the UPRN is such a powerful thing for us to use. So the UPRN is a an identifier number for every address in the UK. Yeah. And that means that if you use an, uh, an identifier and I use the same identifier, a computer can find it very, very easy to compare and say, we're talking about the same buildings. Now, personally, I don't think we're all about to start losing our learning our UPRNs. We're still going to use the address system. Nothing's going to change. Yeah. But behind that, the computer should be working out what the UPRN is. So when I share my data with you, in the background, the computer can go, ah, we're talking about the same address here. Yeah. So I think in, in terms of standardization, I think there are three things that need to be done. One is about the cultural aspect. Another one is standardizing forgive the pun, the language that we use and making that more consistent. And then the third one is having a way of tying those together. And one of the best ways of doing that for the property sector, I think in the UK is the UPRN. Yeah, I mean, it just makes perfect sense. I, I get it. So in, in terms of that the UK side, talk to me about your feelings and thoughts of the UK versus other markets. And what are the challenges those other markets have if they are different to what the UK has? Because I don't think there's many people with that sort of um, a perspective. I think we're very, especially when it comes to data, very centric to our own particular markets. Mm. I think that most of the most of the data challenges that we face in the property sector are global, apart from when it starts interacting with government data. So I think it's that government legislation, government data, which is the local bit. And I think if you look at the UK market, We've probably so, hang on, sorry, just, sorry, just so I understand that. So I think you're saying that the challenges around data are similar across the board in terms of all different sort of countries. But what you're saying is is the the nuance is when it comes to the um, the interaction with the government level data leveled on top. Is that right? Just so I'm clear. Yeah. Okay, and, cool. and and I mean, you'll be familiar with lots of companies that have come from France to the UK, UK to Norway, Norway to the US, and they've all come unstuck because what appears to be the same data in each local market actually. It, and so that's where the challenge comes. And if you look at our UK situation on a global basis, I would argue that we've got one of the best data infrastructures in the world. Our greatest strength is that we've had it in place for 100, 200 years. Ordnance Survey, Land Registry, the Valuation Office have been around for ages. Now, ironically, yeah. our greatest weakness is that they've been around for 200 years. So they're very... Yeah, it's a, it's a strength and a weakness in, in equal measures, right? Yeah, yeah. got it. And so it, it's hard to access. They're written on paper or, or you know, microfilm or whatever it might be. Um, we have a system designed for the way that the world worked several years ago. We haven't evolved it. So there are situations where starting with a clean sheet of paper is, is an advantage. And I think if you look around the world, there are two different market dynamics here that you can look at. So I would say that the UK has got one of, if not the best, data infrastructure. But we are not advanced in some place, as some places in making it as open and accessible as possible. If you look at the Nordics, generally, they have an approach of making a funding, so it's good quality data, but then making all data open and available. So therefore, in the Nordics, they have much more readily accessible information than we do here. It's not that the data is necessarily better, although actually I think they do a few things which are which we could learn from, but it's about their approach to it and their funding of it. So it's good quality data that's more accessible, which allows people to build on. If you look at somewhere like the Middle East, they tend to be a long, long way behind because they haven't had this data infrastructure for a long time. But that is also a massive advantage for them because if they take the right approach, they can start with a blank sheet of paper of what good looks like. And so they can get away from all of our historic problems and challenges. Now, if you're looking at property decisions, some decisions don't need that historic data. They just need to have whatever is on the ground now, in which case other markets can be an advantage because they've got great data. 
some decisions, like if you're buying a house, you don't want to just know what's happening today. You want to know the history of planning applications and local land charges and 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 and, and therefore we're in a strong position. So I think that around the world, different markets have different strengths and weaknesses. Part of that is the history of data that they've got. Part of that is their cultural approach to it. And then on top of that, depending on what you want to do, sometimes different answers are, are, are good in different ways. It's interesting, isn't it? Because I, I remember I was in Bahrain, maybe it was late last year, actually, I think. And I remember being incredibly impressed with their data strategy. Incredibly. Because whilst, and I agree with you, they haven't got a lot of data, what they did have as, as government edict was it's transparent for everybody. Everyone can have access. We're not going to charge you for it. We want you to build off of our data. And I found that incredibly refreshing. And I just don't, I, I don't see that here in the UK. I certainly don't see that in some parts of the US, um, obviously where it's a state by state, often um, legislated um, data access. So I, I do find that interesting that you, you've, you've brought about the fact that there are different regions have different attitudes because of two things. Number one, it's the access. Number two, it's the culture. And I hadn't really thought about that. And, um, and I suppose along with the culture, you'll make a good point about the funding here. So there is an issue with funding. So if we pick on ordnance survey, land registry type data, should that be open and available for everyone, which is the, the route that some places, and it sounds like Bahrain, which is not a place I know well, but if they're taking that approach, that's great. But why would you fund that? to allow other people to make money on it. And the only way you can justify it is because there's a common sense logic to make all that data available and then people can go and build on top of it because they've got it and they can play with it. And ultimately that will be better for the economy. And that's a well-trodden argument that, that is very valid and there's evidence behind that. However, there is also a basis of that data needs a lot of funding why would you why would you for example expect me as a tax sorry why just go back to me for a second that, that data needs a lot of funding what what did you mean by that to, to be managed so 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 if we assume that all data needs to be managed in some shape or form that management has a cost whether that's going out and surveying whether it's storage right. wh whatever else so someone somewhere needs to fund that now that can come from central government right. or you could say well actually why should my taxes be paying for someone else's planning permission money and the data cost of the planning permission is i don't know five pounds ten pounds it, it doesn't matter what it is because there's then a logic about getting the planning pl application to charge it so yeah. you've got these two very clear arguments um, and i think there's real validity in both one is make it open and the economy will grow and that's great Another one is user pays. It needs to be charged for, user pays, and it really helps to drive direction of where the value is because if people are paying for it, it's valuable. If they're not, it's not. The issue with that is that final model, I think in many ways makes more sense, but there are times when either the person who needs to use the data isn't going to get the value. The UPRN might be an example of that. Me using the UPRN and giving it to you is actually going to benefit you sometimes rather than me. Therefore, why should I pay for it? And secondly, um, th there is the trial and error experiment with stuff model to see where the value comes from. And if it's prohibitively expensive, no one is going to do that. And so I think there are two clear business models. One is the central government funds it. Another one is that the user pays. And of course, there are mixtures of the two. Where you get to is is having a clear direction of that because what we find in the UK is that we have people pulling in both directions. Yeah. Now there are initiatives around open data to make more information open and available in the middle there, which government organisations are doing, and they're trying to and probably successfully to a degree balance those two bits. Release the information for free for the innovation bit. And then charge. Go on, do it. Do a cough. Come on, do a cough. I I, I can see. I can see you want to do it. I'm starting to cry. It's never a good thing. <laughs> That's never good at five o'clock on a Friday afternoon that you want to cry. There you go.
Oh, you're back. <laughs> cool. So, yeah, I, it, I, it's interesting, isn't it, on, on the two philosophies? And again, it, it's, it's nice to define them as two very separate elements and and almost one of them is payment at source the other one is the is the is the gamble of effectively trickle down economics which is you sort of give it away and it will eventually trickle in but it won't be uh, it won't be immediate and we're in a situation we have been for a long time where if you look at the UK from I don't know 2006 or something the, the government and without getting political whatever people think about governments it's not an easy argument to say we want to take 500 million or a billion or whatever it is to invest in making data more open because we think in 10 years time, it's going to have a really positive impact. And therefore, yeah. and I think that's true for all governments, but I think that the Nordics had already taken that decision about it, for example, therefore we are a little bit stuck in where we are and less able to move to a new position or a new approach. Yeah, I would. Um, I would agree. So, look, I'm uh, conscious of, of time and, and and obviously time of the week as well. So, I suppose one one final question for me in terms of uh, sort of you know this is all about a book and the element for for the writing of this is going to be, you know, there there is going to be a probably a chapter with lots of sub areas around data within the built environment. It's all talking about digital transformation. It's all talking about innovative leadership so it's not it's actually not a book about real estate it's a book about digital transformation innovation leadership with examples of of the framework which apply directly to real estate um so that you know people can actually then say ah right i understand where you know what that element of the framework means so i, I get where i should go if, if you were me writing about data how would you how would you go about that chapter? How would you bring it to life and and make it? Um, I, don't, I don't mean it make it readable, but how how would you how would you structure a chapter about data? So this is not that really cool, I know. Yeah, which is probably something to to think about. Because I think there are a couple of things that it would be good to see covered in a book. I'll answer it that way. One is. What, what is data? I think there is a, a lack of understanding about what data is. Um, I don't think that needs to be a particularly technical, complicated answer, but I think an understanding of what data is and what data isn't is important. For example, it's not tangible. For example, it's easy to replicate. You and I can have two yeah. different data sets about the same thing. I think... Um, I think that's probably a really good starting point. And then the second part is getting people to understand the value of data. So if you look into the real estate sector, we pay for data at different times. So all of those businesses I, I spoke about that I'd work for, many different tech companies that are out there at the moment are doing data and people will pay for it. Therefore, there is an inherent inherent understanding that that data is valuable. Um, if I have two identical buildings at the moment, one with a perfect data model, one without, it is already proven that you can run it more efficiently, you can have shorter vacancies, you have higher rents. Therefore, that building is more valuable. But having a data model itself is not um, built into the valuation process. And I think that is indicative of our culture of not believing that data has a value even though ironically we sometimes pay for it. And so mm. I think understanding the value of data is a really, really important thing. I think that that is probably a good starting point about understanding <clears throat> what data is, data, data has value, <clears throat> and then understanding some of the challenges that we face that other people who are data geeks and data geeks can solve. Data standards is an example for your typical real estate professional. Uh, and I don't know exactly who the audience is for this, but if you look at the typical real estate professional, they don't need to know the ins and outs of data standards. What they do need to know is having standardized data is going to help them in their job a lot. Yeah, I agree entirely on that. Over the longer term as well. Um, I, I get it. All right, Dan, thanks ever so much. Um, I, I think that is more than enough. And, and genuinely, thanks ever so much for for all of your time on all of that. that that's really um, useful in, in the terms of, of sort of